Hello, church. I'm Pastor Mike, one of the pastors here, and we're going to continue on in our discussion of gentle and lowly. This has been such a wonderful time that we have been able to spend together looking into the heart of Christ for his people. We're going to be in chapter 15 in this video, and it's titled His Natural Work and His Strange Work. And the, the theme verse for this chapter is Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 33, with the focus on the passage that says, he does not afflict from his heart. And Orland in this chapter is really trying to convey the idea that God's disposition towards humanity is that of love and of mercy and of grace. And on page 139, uh, he says, my brethren, though God is just, yet his mercy may in some respect said to be more natural to him than all acts of justice itself that God does show. He continues on to say, the scriptures so express it, there is something in it that is contrary to him. And he's talking about uh, uh, judgment or wrath. I desire not the death of a sinner, that is, I delight not simply in it for pleasure's sake. And so Ortland here, as he's pointing towards the mercy of God, is saying, yes, God does have wrath towards the sinner. Yes, God judge, does judge sin. Uh, but he takes no direct pleasure in the judgment of that sin. The, the, the judgment of the, the wicked is not the thing that God delights in. He moves on to say again on page 39, but when he comes to show mercy to manifest that it is his nature and disposition. It is said that he does it with his whole heart. And so affliction does not come from his heart. He does not afflict from his heart. But when he shows mercy, it comes directly from his heart. And I think this paragraph, again, on page 139, kind of summarizes this whole chapter, and I'll read it to you. And its entirety. It says, therefore, in Lamentations 3.33, when he speaks of punishing, he says, he does not from his heart afflict nor grieve the children of men. But when he comes to speak of showing mercy, he says he does it with his whole heart and with his whole soul, as the expression is in Jeremiah 32.41. And therefore, acts of justice are called his strange work and his strange act in Isaiah 28 and 21. Or, excuse me, in Isaiah 28, 21. But when he comes to show mercy, he rejoices over them to do them good with his whole heart and with his whole soul. And so there's something that can happen here when we're saying that God gives mercy from his heart and yet he afflicts not from his heart. And you can begin to think that there's some kind of separation or, or incoherence within God, that, that somehow his judgment and his, his mercy are, are in conflict with one another. So Ortland goes on to explain that within God, there is a, um, a fullness of, of attributes. So God is not part wrath and part love and, and part this and part that, but God is complete and full in each one of his attributes. He, we can't separate God out into parts. And so this leads me to a question for uh, the gentlemen who are on stage with me today, and that's Pastor Todd and Pastor Brian. And that is, there seems to be a tendency within uh, different denominations and even kind of different churches and stuff to emphasize different aspects of uh, the attributes or, or the emotions um, of God. And so why do you think that there might be that going on, like that certain attributes get emphasized? And then what are some of the dangers of overemphasizing one of God's attributes to kind of diminish another, another one of his attributes? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I feel like, yeah, there's probably several answers to it. Uh, one that comes to mind is... Uh, like just thinking about our culture and what our culture says about God, what our culture thinks about God, um, you know, and certain things will happen, I feel like, in our culture uh, that will, you know, create certain narratives. And so, like, you think about people, that at one point there's a group of people, like, picketing outside of different things, like, holding up signs that say, like, God hates this and quoting Bible verses. Mm -hmm. And it can kind of create this kind of 
idea that this this is what God is like. This is what the Bible says about God. Uh, and yet, um, the Bible is not, you know, this story about how God judges those who have now rebelled against him. It's mainly a story about how, yes, creation has rebelled against him, but how God rescues us, how he comes to, to save those who are opposed to him. And so I, I think as you read the Bible, like you see, uh, there, there, God's judgment is there, but his mercy is also there. And I would even say like it kind of prioritizes his mercy in, when you think about the story of scripture being like the story of redemption. Like that's a story of God's mercy. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's one way. Another, another way I think is, um, I, I think like the, the, the homes that we grow up in, I think shape the way we think about God. Um, like I just think our parents have, um, yeah, they, they have an ability to either, you know, help us to see God more clearly for who he is or, or less clearly. And I remember a conversation I was having with a friend who just, yeah, he grew up in a, in a broken home and, um, right now he's in a place where he's just bitter towards God and angry towards God. And, and I feel like a lot of the things that he tells me uh, that he sees God in certain ways are ways that he sees his dad because of how he's treated him. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's another way, uh, that we kind of have a skewed view of who God is. Yeah, that's really good. And I think that's really true that our upbringing does a lot of that with us. And I think there's also a tendency that we, we just always tend to, like, when you're unsaved, I think there's a lot of tendency to think we are just better than we are. And so, yeah. you know, God should love us, you yeah. know. And then when we come face to face and you realize that, no, he shouldn't, then we deserve hell. Yeah. Well, then sometimes I think we just tend to overstep into that as we become Christians sometimes. And it's like, well, I deserve this, and but God sent grace and love and salvation. And so we live in that. But the second we start to realize again that we're still tempted by sin and given into that, yeah. we tend to overemphasize that as well. That's and right. we forget God's love because we're focused again. It's always almost because we're focusing on self. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we get back to that center. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. And I, I think some of the dangers are uh, you kind of turning God into like the God that, that we want him to be. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll find people that are overemphasizing God's love but they're not really emphasizing the actual love of God. They're overemphasizing love in the way that they understand love. Like a lot of people, when they say the love of God, they're just thinking about like prosperity or comfort or things like this. And so when difficulty comes into life, uh, they might think, well, I thought God was a God of love. Like, like what's going on here? Like, and, and then, so if we, we have a misunderstanding of who God is and how God has has uh, conveyed himself to be through the scriptures to us, then that can easily lead us to sort of what you guys were talking about, um, like a disillusionment with, with God, like this idea that, that God isn't uh, upholding his end of the bargain, if you will. Um, but that's because you misunderstood what God had told you that he was like in the first place. And so I, I think that this is something that, that we can find in one of the, one of the pitfalls in that. Yeah. And, and so uh, Todd made mention to this idea of kind of like feeling like we deserve wrath or we deserve, you know, God's uh, love or something like that. And Orland points out on page 141, uh, he talks about Hosea 11. And uh, it's, it's God approaching Israel in their spiritual fornication, like their kind of like rejection of God. And he, and he lays out all these things that, that Israel uh, has done and, and this love that God had for him. And it's kind of in the, in the top middle section of the first paragraph. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. This is all from Hosea 11. And indeed, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms. I led them with cords of kindness. With the bands of love, I bent down to them and fed them. Yet despite this tender care, my people are bent on turning away from me and persistent in idolatry. And then he asked the question, what then is God's response? And, and before we, we get to the response that, that God has, like think about that, uh, you guys watching at home, like how would you respond to that situation? Like if that was your child or, or you know, somebody that, that you were caring for and loving and they were just obstinate toward you and pushing away from you, like... I can imagine how I might respond to that. But listen to God's response. It's in Hosea 11, verses 8 and 9. It says, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? 
My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. So uh, I think you're right, Todd. I think Christians oftentimes feel like uh, God's angry with them or upset with them or, or they deserve more of God's wrath and anger towards them. And non-Christians oftentimes feel like uh, they deserve God's love. Like, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Like, yeah, I'm going to go to heaven. Like, I'm a good person. God loves me. Like, everything's great. Um, how do you think we got that so backwards? I think of it sometimes just in the nature. Like a word picture kept coming to mind looking at this whole chapter and this whole area of God. And one was like when you are disciplining your own child mm-hmm. and how when something goes wrong, there are times where I have to admit I've been very angry at my child, mm. but there are many times where what they have done is just simply been something wrong and your heart does kind of recoil. It's like, oh no, now I, now I need to go deal with this and I need to go into this child and I need to try and, and, and correct this. And you go in there and you deal with discipline and you bring them back out and they come out and they're questioning, do you still love me, Dad? Mm. And so they get it wrong because they're in the middle of the discipline. And I think sometimes that's true of us too. We get it wrong sometimes at different stages when we're in our life because of what we're going through. We might be in a time where God is working with us and training us and we're just like, do you still love me, God? Is, is this is really where I'm at right mm-hmm. now? Or, or it might be a time where you are just really in God's love and you're just enjoying that pleasure mm-hmm. and you forget about the fear of the Lord. You know? and so, so I think looking at my child, my children, the family dynamic, I think it's a great picture of the heart of a parent is like, of course I still love you. Of course I'm still in it. This is for something out here. Mm-hmm. And it, it does go against my nature to even want to, to, to discipline. But the end is going to bear this peaceful fruit of righteousness. It's going to be right. great. So, Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I thought of, of parenting and discipline as well. And just that whole, uh, I don't know if your parents ever told this to you before, like before you, they disciplined you, it was like, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> and yeah, it was right, like, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would say something like, when you're a parent, you'll understand. And, and now that I am a parent, and there have been times where I've had to discipline my kids, uh, yeah, I'm not perfect. There's been times where I've done it out of anger, but there's those times when it's like, yeah, like God calls me to discipline them now. And there's something in me that's like, oh, like I, I don't want to discipline them, but I know this is what's best for them. Mm. Um, and so the actual discipline doesn't bring me any joy, mm-hmm. but kind of the fruit or the hope of the fruit that this will, you know, steer them back to the Lord. That's what, that's kind of what I think gives, um, kind of the the satisfaction or, or the peace about it and i think he, he mentions that about about god like it's not uh and him bringing the affliction that doesn't it's not like that's bringing god pleasure mm-hmm. um like look at all this pain i can inflict uh i think on page 138 the bottom paragraph he says the one who rules and ordains all things brings affliction into our lives with a certain divine reluctance. He is not reluctant about the ultimate good that is going to be brought about through that pain. That is indeed why he is doing it. But something recoils within him in sending that affliction. The pain itself does not reflect his heart. He is not a platonic force pulling heaven's levers and pulleys in a way that is detached from the real pain and anguish we feel at his hand. Um, and then he talks about punishing Israel and he says he is sending what they deserve, but his deepest heart is their merciful restoration. Mm, and, and another example came to mind is like when, when Jesus hears about Lazarus and it says that he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and then he stayed four days and like he, he allowed, he allowed Lazarus to die and them to go through that suffering. He allowed affliction into their lives, but it was because he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead and he was going to give you, you know, a fuller picture of his glory and who he is, give more of himself to them in a way that wouldn't have been possible if he just went and healed him. Because he raised him from the dead and they went through that affliction, they were actually able to receive more of Jesus. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, great stuff, guys. And like, I think this is the heart of God, and we see it over and over and over and over in the scriptures. Uh, we see it 
at the Tower of Babel when all the people are coming together and they're trying to, 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 to amass greatness for themselves and God spreads them out all over the world and we might think like, oh, that's such a terrible thing for God to do, but that's actually, it, it's a divine mercy, right? That, that he's getting them out of their own way so that they can come and, and eventually turn to him and, and we just see that over and over and over. Yeah. We see that same thing in Christ as yeah. he chases down sinners and he brings them to repentance. Yeah. And uh, we could talk about this for probably the rest of the day, just this chapter. And hopefully you guys and your groups will do that. And uh, you will enjoy discussing the rest of the things that you can find uh, in the depths of chapter 15. Thanks.